And welcome everybody. We're so glad you're here tonight joining us for this program. We have the National Park Service Student Showcase uh, program uh, beginning in just a moment. And I think everybody uh, on our end is here. All right, thank you again for joining us this evening. I'm Maggie Burnett Stogner, Executive Director of the Center for Environmental Filmmaking at American University School, um, School of Communication. And we're just delighted that you're all here tonight. This is a very special program for us. And I just wanna say a word about the center. The center is committed to launching the next generation of our environmental filmmakers. And we could not do it without our partners. And that's what this evening is all about. This incredible partnership with the National Park Service. First, I want to thank the Environmental Film Festival in the nation's capital. We've been partners with them for quite a long time, and they are responsible for making this event possible. To the ongoing incredible partnership with the National Park Service, and to our co-host, Tracy Betts, Chief Curator of the U.S. Department of Interior Museum. Hello, Tracy. And Ryan Hathaway, Head of the Department of the U.S. Department of Interior's Environmental Justice Program. Hey, Ryan. And to the folks behind the scenes, because we could never make this happen without them, um, many, many thanks to everybody who's worked so hard to pull this evening together. And of course, many thanks to American University's School of Communication support, ongoing support for the Center for Environmental Filmmaking. And a shout out to all of our students who are attending this program tonight. I have students from two different classes um, here tonight and several others as well. Um, as we go through the event this evening, please feel free to put your questions in the chat and we will address those uh, later in the program. And if you haven't seen the videos yet, go to the National Park Service Student Shorts on the festival site. They're available through the 27th. There's a whole playlist and you'll enjoy them very much. And now I have two very special guests um, that I would love to introduce for tonight's program. Uh, please join me in welcoming American University School of Communications Dean Sam Fullwood, who will make a few introductory remarks and then introduce the new director of the National Park Service, Chuck Sams. Take it away, Sam. Thank you, Maggie. I am truly delighted to be here tonight to acknowledge this valuable partnership. American University School of Communication is committed to advancing the next generation of change makers. Our programs empower students to create compelling climate science and environmental justice media. So many thanks to the National Park Service for providing our students with these outstanding opportunities. It is my great pleasure to introduce Chuck Sams, the 19th director of the National Park Service. Charles F. Chuck Sams III was ceremonially sworn in as the 19th director of the Park Service on December 16th, 2021 by Interior Secretary Deb Howland. Director Sam is Cayuse and Walla Walla and a member of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation in Northeast Oregon, where he grew up. He is also blood ties to the Cocopa Tribe and the Yankton Sioux of Fort Peck. He most recently served as Oregon Governor Kate Brown's appointee to the Pacific Northwest Power and Conservation Council. For more than 25 years, he has dedicated himself to leadership roles that emphasize the responsibility of strong stewardship for land preservation for this and future generations. Director Sams, thank you for joining us tonight and for this exceptional National Park Service partnership with American University's School of Communication. Well, good evening, my friends and relatives. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm so pleased to be with you here this evening. Our partnership with American University is a stellar example of how two institutions can work together to provide valuable opportunities for emerging filmmakers. It is, in the, it is the 150th year anniversary of Yellowstone, the first national park a vision that has grown into a parks and wilderness areas across our great country. There are well-documented history of the visual arts playing key roles in heightening awareness for and or conserving public lands, wildlife, and cultures. It's to include artists like Thomas Moran and photographers like William Henry Jackson, accompanying government-sponsored survey expeditions in the 19th century, 
Ansel Adams photomural project of 1941 and 42, photographing reclamation projects, national parks in Indian country, 20th century American modernist, Charlie Harper's poster series on the flora and fauna of national parks. And I'm so pleased in my own office, I have two of Charlie, Parker's, of Charlie Harper's pieces hanging on my wall. We understand parks and people by telling story. To carry forward our nation's legacy of diverse places and communities, every generation must have its own storytellers and they will tell stories in a new way. The National Park Service is proud to support young storytellers with our university friends. Our partnership with American University Center for Environmental Filmmaking has helped student filmmakers find and tell new, new digital stories about special places, communities, science, and history. They help all of us see and understand parks and ourselves in a new and meaningful way. Their collaboration with us embodies the Park Service priorities connecting and empowering a thriving and diverse workforce, expanding diversity, equity, inclusion, and access in all that we do, respecting indigenous people's connections to the land and meeting the expectations of our multicultural nation and what it has to offer in our parks. I am glad to meet a few of the AU's filmmaking students this evening with their NPS mentors. It is through their talents that they have some, that they have been selected as part of the nation's most prestigious environmental film festival on its 30th anniversary. I congratulate them and wish them continued success and strength, and I hope you enjoy this evening's program. Thank you for having me here this evening. Kutsiaya. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your being here and joining us. I want to say thank you to both Dean Sam Fullwood, Dean of the School of Communication and Director Chuck Sams of the National Park Service. What a wonderful way to kick off this program. And again, thanks so much to our National Park Service partners. For over a decade, NPS has provided fellowships for our students to work with scientists and rangers in the field. This is an invaluable experience for the students. You know, it's, it's, it's one thing to learn in the classroom. It's a completely different thing to be out there in the field, really getting that kind of experience. So tonight's program will take us behind the scenes with the students and their mentors with five different branches of the National Park Service. And then we'll explore what it takes in some very extreme conditions uh, and what it takes to actually translate these complex science concepts into accessible videos for all audiences. And of course, just to see what it's like to be inside the park, working inside the park uh, in, in ways that uh, really give these students just incredible experiences. So I'll introduce each panelist as we go. Um, but before we hear from our panelists, the students and the National Park Service mentors, uh, let's set the stage with a short trailer of clips from the videos. Uh, Monica, can you roll that uh, sizzle reel? very close to Mammoth Cave National Park. My sisters and I had begged my dad to take us, and ever since then I've been hooked on it. The Tully Springs expedition uh, was an effort uh, to determine if Ice Age mammals and humans coexisted. What makes biogeography so important on these mangrove islands? Rather than sit back and say, this is my grandparents' language and no one speaks it anymore, rather than have that happen, for me personally, I can say I did my best to try to pass it on and try to keep it from going away completely. It's peaceful. It's, um, it's beautiful. It's paradise. That story is a really nice example of how our national parks are great for science.
uh, muted, Maggie. Maggie, you're muted. You think after two years, I would learn to unmute myself. <laughs> I still am not there yet. Um, I just was saying, wow, thank you so much uh, for all that great work. It, it's just still uh, so impressive the work that our students are doing with the National Park Service. And um, if you haven't had a chance to watch all of the videos on the festival's eventive platform, uh, you please do so. They're available through March 27th. There's a whole playlist of the entire videos that they've um, created over these last few years. Um, so let's dive in here and start with Chuck Dunkerley and Sarah Gulick. Um, Chuck is a project manager with the National Park Service's Harper's Ferry Center for Interpretive Design, managing projects with the Pacific West and Alaska regions. He has spent the past 25 years as a filmmaker, executive producer, and media manager, developing and presenting award-winning films and media for national parks. And Sarah Gulick is an alum of our program and an award-winning filmmaker and digital media producer at the Design Center. And I want to just start with you, Chuck, because this really started uh, with the Harper's Ferry Interpretive Design Center. Explain to us briefly how the fellowships got started. What was the overall goal? Well, when we work at a national design center, you're always looking for new ways and perspectives to tell <clears throat> Park Service stories. You're also looking for new products and distribution channels about how to do that. Um, and we found out about the Center for Environmental, Fil Environmental Filmmaking over 10 years ago. Um, and it seemed like a group we should get to know. Um, and, and there was a lot of mission alignment there with the Park Service and what CEF was set up to do. Um, and what we found was not only uh, a lot of mission alignment, but there was a, uh, a very talented pool, uh, pool of students who were producing at a very high production, uh, production level. Um, and we started to find ways to work together and started to find ways to take new perspectives on our stories and how do we, you know, in, in different platforms on which we can produce those. Uh, one of the big projects that laid the groundwork was the uh, wilderness series uh, for the 50th commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness uh, Wilderness Act. Uh, um, we produced, uh, that's where Sarah Gulick was uh, brought on board as well as Aaron Finnecane and, and uh, Sylvia Johnson. Um, and uh, we produced over 20 videos that were really well received um, everywhere they went. Um, they're still out there doing their work, telling stories of Park Service wilderness areas. Um, and when you have success like that, you kind of want to to repeat it. So we're always looking for ways to kind of continue to collaborate. Um, and it was always that talent pool, mission alignment, and high quality product, and new ways to tell our stories. As Director Sam said, a, a diff different perspective, a different way um, to kind of maintain relevancy. Um, and it's just been really great over the years. We're happy that we're able to work in Glacier Bay with you guys as well. Um, we're very happy uh, with, with all of that. Well, th thank you so much because it really it did kick off an amazing um, mm -hmm. number of years of being able to uh, do these different fellowships. And Sarah, I just would love for you and you know you and, and Aaron uh, Finnecane and Sarah Johnson, you really were the first uh, to be awarded these fellowships to do these videos uh, in these very remote wilderness areas. So um, why don't you share with us a memorable experience in those back in those days? Yeah, I think. Um... One that immediately comes to mind thinking back in the days, but kind of full circle since we're here with Glacier Bay um, was my first trip to Alaska, which was to film in Denali and Wrangell St. Elias, um, which I'm like still impressed with, <laughs> with back then me. Um, but one of the things we wanted to do with the series was really kind of counter some of the misconceptions about wilderness. And so the series really explored just diverse connections to these special places. And a lot of those were through character profiles. And so in Wrangell St. Elias, I profiled a bush pilot and he actually had grown up there before it was even a park. And so like he saw it first as home. Um, and that was just a really, really different perspective to this, you know, we think of it as this, this park and to him it was home. And as a pilot flying there every day, he had this really amazing vantage point that just showed the interconnectedness of the landscape. And he just had a really deep sense of place and his connection to it. And so, but I mean, just to fly over, um, just it's an incredible park, just absolutely enormous, absolutely spectacular, you know, and a little bush plane with someone with that deep of a connection 
uh, it was a very kind of pinch yourself kind of moment and definitely um, very memorable. And I think it set the stage, um, as we'll talk a little bit more about Glacier Bay to that idea of, of sense of place and of, you know, these wild, what we think of as wild places and parks as being home and homeland. Yeah, well, I, I just remember being so impressed because it wasn't like you'd had any camping experience or outdoor experience in, in wilderness areas before you took off to someplace like Alaska in the remote uh, areas. And, uh, and, and you just held it together, you and Erin and Sylvia, just amazing, amazing. Um, so I think we should just follow up because I know there are a lot of students watching uh, tonight. Just um, what advice would you give to students who are interested in following in your footsteps? <laughs> um, you know, I think maybe this has shifted a little bit, but I know when I was in school, a lot of emerging filmmakers really looked at, at other projects as kind of stepping stones to a feature film. Like that was kind of on the pedestal of like having made it. And those films are definitely important, but I think for the work that I do, there's a little bit of a mind shift um, because really your focus is on helping an organization meet its mission. And that can just be just really incredibly, incredibly rewarding. And so my advice to students is actually to look for ways that you can be of service to you know, missions that you care about. Like we all know, I think that's why we get into this is the power of film um, to change, to make change and, and independent films are, are absolutely good ways to do that. But I encourage folks to really get just as excited about uh, working with organizations and, and creating media for that. Yeah, that's, that's really great advice. Um, so I, I just wanna, uh, I wish, because every single person here tonight, I would love to have an in-depth discussion with, but we're moving fairly quickly because we have a lot of people. And with us tonight also is Mary Beth Moss, the cultural anthropologist and tribal liaison at the Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve. And the Glacier Bay is uh, the homeland for the Huna Tlingit. And um, Mary Beth, you know, this is the latest project that, um, that Sarah and the Interpretive Center, Design Center, and two of our students, Beth and Nick, have been working on. And, and let's start with you, Mary Beth. If you could just describe the goals for the Tlingit uh, Glacier Bay videos that uh, Sarah first started filming six years ago, and the series of short videos that our students, Beth Ibish and Nick Tucker, edited this past year. Uh, Mary Beth is muted. We're gonna. Uh, <laughs> there we go. I'm following in your footsteps. <laughs> sorry, I said a bad trend. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sorry about that. We first met Chuck and other Harper's Ferry folks. I think back in 2014, they came up to Glacier Bay to help us develop interpretive site plans for the Huna Tribal House, which wasn't even built back then, but um, but was in the process of being designed and built. Um, and they helped us lay out a range of interpretive programs for the tribal house, um, one of which was um, the concept of a feature film that could be shown at the tribal house. Um, and so Sarah and uh, David Ehrenberg traveled up to both Glacier Bay and also the community of Huna, which is a native village about 30 miles from Glacier Bay, um, and spent quite a bit of time uh, there with us. Um, filming both in the park and in the, the village of Huna. And, um, you know, to be perfectly honest, we weren't sure how that was going to go. We had had other uh, filming adventures in the community and um, not all of them had been particularly culturally sensitive from some other outside filmmakers. Um, but David and Sarah um, and Chuck made such an effort to become really to become members of the community. And I think that's how the community views them today. They spent quite a bit of time. Um, and what, what um, came out of that experience was an outpouring of stories. So we had initially hoped to just capture the story of the, the carving and building of the tribal house. Um, and we ended up with so many stories and so much footage. I don't, I don't know how many hours of footage uh, Sarah and Dave collected, but, um, that uh, we quickly realized that we had the need for more than just one film. So we ended up with the concepts of um, two feature films and then a series of shorts. And uh, Chuck and 
Sarah rolled out the idea of reaching out to the AU students. And um, I found it really fascinating. As soon as we uh, met Beck, uh, Beth and Nick, um, they connected immediately with the tribe. Um, there was this sense of trust that Sarah and David and Chuck had built from before, and that just extended to the AU students. Um, they met several times um, online to discuss what kinds of films might, um, you know, that might come about. And that the idea was to focus on um, portraying the Huna community as a living and evolving community. So um, that's what Beth and Nick did. They came up with these six beautiful films. And um, I think the treasure is that, um, you know, so often we hear people in indigenous communities saying, these outsiders came and they took from us, they took our knowledge, they took, they filmed us, they recorded us and they never come back. Um, and in this case, we had promised, <clears throat> excuse me, we had promised to do one film um, and we ended up doing eight, I think. Um, and that's, that was through the, um, the assistance of the American University students. So a real gift for our community. Thank you so much. And you know, that, that you make such an important point about if there's, not just parachuting in, but really working to establish that relationship and that trust and how important that is. And Beth and Nick, I, I have a question here from Tracy, the chief curator of the Department of Interior Museum. I, th I thought this was such a great question. How do you view your role on this video series as interpreters, influencers, and storytellers? What do you hope the public takes away from your work? So um, Beth, Nick, either one of you want to dive in on that one? Sure. So I guess we were uniquely positioned as you know media and art students to look at these films through an academic lens and an artistic lens like we got this awesome opportunity with all of this pre-existing footage and collaboration from the community that the films were about that we could go in look at the footage it was a beautiful massive pile and then go in and figure out oh what films would be great. And what films does the community need? And Beth, do you wanna pick up from there? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, as Mary Beth was saying, it was a really special opportunity for us to come in as outsiders, but it was really awesome to get to work with the tribe and understand what they wanted out of the project. And a big point that they wanted to make was pride in community and being able to have people connect from the outside and um, learn about their culture and, just looking at the footage, it was so evident that it was all there. So it was really fun to get to put it together and tell that story and work really collaboratively with the folks from the tribe. Um, and then, yeah, it was fun to have an end product that everyone was excited about. Yeah, it was super unique for us to really have an interpreter role in that way. Because a lot of the time we're making our films, small documentary films from the ground up. So this was a very different and fruitful experience. Yeah, and I, I have to say, I really appreciated the groundwork that, that Sarah um, and Chuck laid and, and all of the process that went into understanding how to work with these videos. Um, again, for our students, it, that's invaluable. It's the field experience, but it's also the experience of working with the National Park mentors. And, and Sarah and Chuck are just amazing mentors in helping um, our students understand that there is a process, that there is a foundation that needs to be built. It's not just, oh, let's go to this place and make a film, that there's a lot of thought that goes into it. Um, so I really uh, appreciated seeing some of that process. Um, Beth and Nick, I just uh, wonder if you could each share just a short you know, takeaway from this experience for you each personally. Sure, do you wanna go first? You can go first. <laughs> No, I'll go first. <laughs> um, one thing that we kind of settled on for a few of the films was having cultural food vignettes, which was really fun to work on because what's something that everyone has in common is that we all eat. <laughs> so it's really fun to find out about, you know, similarities. We saw smoked salmon, you know, I've had smoked salmon, love it. It's cool to see it in the indigenous um, frame and how they catch it and smoke it at home in smokehouses. It was really interesting just for us learning and getting to um, work with that footage. But um, yeah, and then we also saw things that I'd never heard about before, like gumboots, the mussels that um, they harvest from the beaches. So that was really fun to get to um, kind of work with that 
connection of food. I guess the big takeaway for me is that I, I love short, like online documentary content. And then, so it was an absolute pleasure to be able to look through a pile of existing footage, a collection of existing footage, and at the same time, like researching the topics involved in the footage and asking people like, oh, what's going on here? What's this? And trying to figure out a story through that footage. So I've made quite a few films. You can check out my stuff. There's a lot on there, but I've never had an opportunity like this before. Awesome. That's great. Well, I'm just going to say to the audience, feel free to put your questions uh, in the chat and we'll get to those at the end of the program. But as we go along, you know, just put them in there and then I'll go back and check um, the chat at the end of the program and we'll get to some of those questions. Um, we need to move on. So now let's go to another branch of the National Park Service. Thank you, Chuck and Sarah and Nick and Beth. Appreciate your, uh, your participating in this program very much. Um, we're gonna to go to Tim Watkins, who's the National Park Service Science Access and Engagement Coordinator. He launched a new series of science history stories with Robert Boyd, an alum of our program, who recently, recently graduated and uh, ended up getting the National Geographic Storytelling Fulbright, and he's now filming in Barbados. So um, thank you for joining us, being able to join us, Robert. And uh, Tim, let's start with you. What is your vision for this particular video series? Yeah, so, you know, national parks preserve and celebrate and help people understand our nation's great, diverse, natural and cultural heritage. And I think most people understand parks and interact with parks in that context. But parks are also where some great science happens. And in many cases, really famous science gets done, even science that has launched whole disciplines and new technologies. And so as a result, parks also preserve and celebrate our shared intellectual heritage. And my vision and my goal with this is to create short videos that tell some of those stories, hopefully in a fun way, highlight this underappreciated side of national parks, and maybe capture the interest of new audiences in some new ways. Well, I, you had a great vision because that's exactly what you've been doing. <laughs> um, Robert, why don't you take us behind the scenes in, in the Everglades? Because that was one of uh, the first ones you and Tim worked on together. And what was your steepest learning curve? Sure, sure thing. Uh, I absolutely loved the Everglades. Uh, maybe one day I'll move down to Florida so I can, I can live there forever. Um, but as far as a steep learning curve, I would say one of the, the best lessons I got was on how to prepare for audio outdoors. Because some of the things that you love most about the Everglades, the wind, the very loud shrill birds flying overhead, um, are also the things that can mess with a, a film outside. So learning how to juggle that and then juggle that with a three different people we were interviewing, me, Tim, and our, uh, our subject um, was very, very fun. It was very fun, it was fascinating. So that was a steep learning curve. The other thing is I learned when, I, I'm, I'm kind of a heavy person. So when you're a heavy person and you carry heavy gear, you, you tend to sink into sand. So I felt like I was in an Indiana Jones movie uh, just standing out there during the interview. Uh, like Tim, Tim and, and was like up here. I was like down here. I, I thought I was going to drown. So that's fascinating. Oh, <laughs> okay. I, I know that picture you're talking about, but I didn't realize that that was what was happening. <laughs> yeah. Sinking and sinking. Um, you know, I would love for you to, to just talk for a moment about how this helped you get the very, very competitive National Geographic storytelling Fulbright. What was it about this, this experience and, and the Indiana Dunes um, experience that, that helped um, help you be in the, the, you know, win something that was just so, so difficult to get in this, the Fulbright? Yeah, so it's, I, I feel really fortunate to have gotten this, uh, this, this National Geographic Fulbright project. I would say uh, this project was very important because it gave me some real on the ground experience doing a, a big project. I had done stuff on the ground before, but um, 
this was at like a whole different level. So just getting that crash course, uh, like I said before, dealing with all the audio, uh, working to put that film together, editing it afterwards, uh, from start to finish the pipeline, it, it was a good crash course that you can't, class prepares you for it, but then you, you hone it out in the field. So that's what I'd say, uh, yeah, there's that. Yeah, and I and I really, I'll just um, say bravo to the great work you've done and the great work you continue to do. And, and many thanks again to the National Park Service mentors who really held our students to a very high bar. <laughs> and, and I think that that really paid off and, and the students really went there and they met that high bar. Um, Tim, you've been working most recently with Marissa Woods, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, but you've been working on a couple of really awesome videos. I mean, they're just truly fascinating. And if you could just talk briefly about the two videos that you're working on with Marissa. Sure, and I'll just say that Marissa currently, right now is teaching a course at AU, and so she can't join us, but that tells you the caliber of students I'm very pleased with. Um, so Marissa and I are doing two films on the science of dating. Um, uh, one about the origin of radiocarbon dating or carbon-14 dating, uh, which grew out of the Manhattan Project uh, and the years following World War II. And the scientist who invented the method of using radiocarbon to date organic materials won a Nobel Prize. The first time he used that method to actually answer a, a scientific question and resolve a big scientific debate was in the early 1960s in what is now Tule Springs Fossil Beds National Monument outside of Las Vegas. Uh, it had to do with the timing of human uh, presence in that area and whether they were hunting place to see megafauna like you know, mammoths and giant camels. And uh, we finished that video and posted it last summer. The second film is also about dating, um, but this is about the origins of dendrochronology or the use of tree rings to study past climates and also determine the ages of ancient buildings. And that whole branch of science developed um, on the Colorado Plateau with several national park sites that have ancient Puebloan buildings. So Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon and places like that. And the person who invented that technique was actually an astronomer with kind of weird ties to the idea that there were canals on Mars. Um, but but he began collaborating with archaeologists in the first decades of the 20th century. And that video is very near completion. And it should be posted later this spring. And I'll just say I'm, um, I'm an ecologist by training. And so the work I did with Robert was you know, easy and close to my heart. Um, the dendrochronology stuff and the, the carbon-14 dating is new. But boy, now I want to go and get retrained as a dendrochronologist. I mean, studying tree rings is really cool. So we get things out of these great projects, too. Right. And a whole new approach to dating videos, right? Exactly. Yes, <laughs> great. Yep. Let me resist that. Sorry. So yep. thank you, Tim and Robert. I really appreciate you joining us today. We are going to move on to Cliff um, McCready. Is he here? Yes, I'm here. All right, Cliff. I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Cliff is the US Biospheres Network Coordinator. Um, this is a relatively uh, newer branch of the National Park Service. And uh, we just had our first uh, alum, Leonidas, um, complete hers. Uh, unfortunately, she could not be here this evening because she's now working on the National Geographic Disney series, Big Little Farm in California. <laughs> so um, she's launched and, and doing great work. Um, so, but we do have Patrick Kirby with us who's working on the current ones. Um, but Cliff, why don't you just take a minute and just um, tell us what you guys have, have been working on. You've been out in the field a lot and um, just give us a sense of what the biosphere uh, videos are about. Yeah, the videos portray the, the, some of the biosphere regions in our system of 28 sites in the country, and they're slightly different than national parks, because although we're proud that they include national parks, they also deliberately embrace places where people live and work in the landscapes around parks, and they're cooperating for sustaining the essential services that nature provides, you know, crop pollination, uh, water for wildlife and people, et cetera. So the biosphere regions are really a new thing in terms of our consciousness and our awareness 
and a way that people can get engaged with uh, the health and well-being of their communities and their connections to parks as well as to the landscapes around them. So yeah, we, um, we've produced uh, two films, as you said, with Leah. I was so proud that she got the Emmy Award for the Mammoth Cave Biosphere Region film, Water Connects Us All. And then Nick and Leah traveled to uh, the Champlain Adirondack National Biosphere Network up in uh, New York and Vermont and uh, produced a great film there as well. And these short films are, are so compelling and so powerful because we interview people that are just great storytellers. And so, um, yeah, uh, I'm really happy that I was connected with Patrick, a National Guardsman serving our country, who's produced some great films. Uh, and one of them I watched was from his service in Bosnia, encouraging soldiers to donate to their blood bank and the importance of that. And then some other great videos he produced. So Patrick and I have, have gone to a big thicket biosphere region in East Texas and filmed there in November. And also at um, Congaree biosphere region in the central Midlands of South Carolina. That's, that's just amazing. And, and yes, thank you for mentioning the Emmy that Leah uh, won for the Mammoth. Uh, and also just the fact that Leah and Nick were out filming during COVID and managed to do that safely and effectively. And uh, really, uh, uh, that was just outstanding, truly a professional level approach to filming in the field during a very difficult time. Um, Patrick, why don't you share with us some of your, uh, you know, a moment or two of, of your experiences in the field. Yeah, so uh, one of that comes to mind right away is we were out filming in Big Thicket, Texas, and we thought we were just going to go film some really nice longleaf pine. And when we rolled up to the situation, there was a bunch of fire trucks and people in yellow suits. And we were like, oh, no, we probably should leave because we don't know what's happening. And uh, our liaison went out and she said, no, no, it's fine. What went up and started talking and like, no, we're going to go film. And we rolled onto this giant wildfire that they were doing a controlled burn on. Um, cause yeah, it was a it was a great experience. We got some really good, really good footage of it, and it really helped further that story of the uh, the good side of what you're doing with these burns to control and and help um, with longleaf pine and, and other things in that area that need fire. So that, that's that's amazing, and and you just dove right in, and and I know it's been a little bit of a juggle with your your national um, service, and and uh, you just um, keep finding ways to just like you did with the flexibility of saying, oh wait, there's another story happening here, we're going to pivot, <laughs> and you keep finding ways to to find the story and and get it filmed, and um and I think that's a true asset for any any filmmaker. So. Yeah, one Bravo. Go One ahead. thing that we were we really uh, had a lucky surprise because one of the members of the fire crew was Frank Solis, a member of the Alabama Cushita tribe, and he described for us how fire was used by indigenous people for millennia to manage the forest and enhance its value for culturally significant plants and for game and to bring back a, a healthy forest. And that's what we're trying to do today in, in other public lands. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think there's an ongoing, it's not just that there's one thing that, um, you know, it's, a, it's an evolving understanding of our lands and our waterways and, and, um, and you continue to capture that in these videos. Um, Patrick, how about sharing just a piece of advice for the students out there? I think one of the biggest things that I've had to take away from this is while most of these aren't my stories because I'm not from that community, we're, we're there to hold the microphone and really amplify that the story of that community. Um, like for instance, when we were in South Carolina and we rolled up and we were filming and in, uh, we interviewed a guy who went to University of South Carolina and later realized that his ancestors, when they were enslaved, they built this building directly across from campus and didn't know it. And we sat and talked to him and interviewed him for maybe half an hour. And it's just such an impactful story that while it's not my story to tell, it's going to carry this this film leaps and bounds because it's such a powerful story. So really just being there to take it all in and, and share it that way. That's that's excellent. Yeah, storytelling is a 
filmmaking is about facilitating uh, very much. So thank you for sharing that. And, and I wish we had more time, but thank you, Cliff, and thank you, Patrick, and thank you to Leah out there in California <laughs> for sharing these stories with us. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, we're going to now move on to uh, Ann Gallagher, uh, the National uh, Park Service. She's a climate change scientist who we've been working with for several years now. There was Sam Shaleen's video about sea level rise at the Bellhaven Marina in Virginia. Uh, Robert Boyd did uh, three videos uh, for the Manassas Battlefield Park. Uh, our alum, Mike Kuba, made four videos about Rock Creek Park, ranging from evasive, um, almost said planets, invasive <laughs> uh, plants to flooding. Um, and, and this partnership continues. Um, and please provide some insights about um, this particular partnership. It's been a really great one. Well, I consider myself the lucky one. As an ecologist coming from the community of scientists, conveying information to people that is important can be tricky. The words we choose and the graphs we want to show may not have the universal appeal we imagine. And partnering up through programs like this one allows us to share ideas about complicated topics in a way that really has visceral meaning to people. And the work that you cited before really were the stepping stone pieces that made it obvious that what we could do together could be so much more valuable than what I could do by myself. The climate change videos that you cited were wonderful examples of telling the story of change, getting multiple perspectives, multiple disciplines tied together to create a storyline that was compelling and shared valuable information and had a variety of different audiences, but also tied the story to a particular location and made it more powerful and more resonant. But the new partnership that we have now was triggered First, we had those wonderful stories, but one day I was looking at a video and it was 30 seconds long. At the end of the video, I knew scientists use submarines and were not done much documenting of the ocean compared to the size of the ocean, that they were surprised a shark was in a particular location and that they had video of the shark. And by the end, all I could think was, I know now something about sharks I didn't know. And I'm so excited. What are the sharks doing? What don't we know? And the curiosity was just um, grown tremendously. And it was 30 seconds long. So I thought, you have brilliant filmmakers. How can we do this kind of idea? How can the, we have wonderful resources in the parks. How do we inspire curiosity about our resources in a visual way? And we had a, a pilot program that was another one of your alumni, Elizabeth Hertzfeld Campreth. She worked with us to design a mechanism to test what in, was engaging. Why did people like a story? Why did they like a video? What made them want to share it? And then she made three videos for George um, Washington Memorial Parkway about their insect program uh, identifying um, um, new species of insects in that particular park and they were so compelling and it was so rewarding that uh, we built the program a little bit more and now have a number of stories we're trying to tell and are currently um, anticipating a lovely rough cut of uh, some videos about falcons breeding in harper's ferry and exciting rattlesnake footage uh, from katakton mountain park and the story of native plants and native pollinators in a park that would not necessarily be associated with natural resources in Wolf Trap um, National Park for the Performing Arts. And so this has just been a tremendous opportunity for the Urban Ecology Research Learning Alliance to share our science with our visitors through your brilliant students. Well, thank you for that. I really love that term of you know science curiosity because it really once you get people hooked, it's hard not to want to know more. <laughs> I was uh, pretty hooked when I heard that oh, some of my students were going to be working with uh, pregnant rattlesnakes and copperheads. <laughs> and Grace Eggleston and Jenna Sittler are both here with us today. Um, Grace, Jenna, uh, okay, 
Tell us about that experience, pregnant rattlesnakes. I, I don't know if I would have gotten on that one. Hi, yeah, that was a really fun shoot to be on. We um, were filming rattlesnakes up in Katotkin Mountain Park, which is about an hour north of DC. And I have to say the fun thing about the urban ecology films is that they're all in the DMV area. So we're not going that far to find cool things like rattlesnakes or peregrine falcons or things like that. But um, yeah, so we went out a couple of different times throughout last year to film the snakes. And in the spring, if you go out, you can find pregnant ones. And we did, and we found some babies and they live under these boulder, like very difficult terrain to climb around with camera gear and try to keep up with the researcher that we were with who took us off trail. So we definitely learned a lot. Um, yeah, we were handing gear to each other, like scrambling up boulders. And, um, and then we went out later in the fall and they were, the snakes were migrating a short distance, but they were just more out. So we found 12 in like two hours, which was a lot for me. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And, and uh, Jenna, who uh, was in my producing um, environmental and wildlife filmmaking class, um, just stepped right in to help out. So Jenna, you want to talk a little bit that you're an undergrad, you know, what did this experience mean to you? Yeah, it was a great experience. Um, it was one of my first like being able to film um, a documentary like out in the field um, as a student, um, I don't have a lot of opportunities um, in like that way. So it was great working with Grace and um, Nick was there too. Um, one, I was very impressed with their ability to carry the equipment during, um, it was a very rough terrain um, environment. And also um, I was working with audio and hearing the, um, the snake expert um, as we were hiking uh I just he would mutter things under his breath and one of them was like keep up like as we were as we were hiking which I thought was very fun um, it was a great environment <laughs> well I'm, I'm so glad you you uh were excited about doing this and and just uh pitched right in and, and hopefully you'll be working on some more of them as well um I I just want to uh pivot now because I know we're we only have so much time but um the newest uh, student fellowship, and, and thank you, Grace and Jenna. Um, and Anne, you helped um, bridge this newest uh, student fellowship with the White House Visitor Center. And I, this is brand new um, to create vid videos that introduce student visitors to pollinators, native plants, and beekeeping at the White House. And we have uh, another undergraduate, film and photography undergraduate student who's in my advanced documentary producing class, Isabella Silva, working on these. And when I mentioned the possibility of this fellowship, her eyes just lit up. And then she showed me these beautiful photographs that she'd already taken of bees. And um, I just uh, would like to um, go to Isabella now and ask, you know, let's, let's just fast forward a moment when you imagine people coming to the White House Visitor Center and watching these um, videos or students in classrooms watching your finished videos, um, what do you hope they'll come away with? Um, so I, I do hope that um, they can be maybe like expi inspired to um, connect with their local environments um, and communities and um, just like kind of be more uh, like curious about, uh, you know, where they live or like what kind of pollinators live there? Um, what kind of animals can they find or um, bugs? Um, yeah, um, I, I think it would be awesome to like um, show this um, garden and uh, kind of like give like this uh, different view since um, it's not uh, super easy to get into the garden either. So um, there's a lot of um, beauty that exists in there. And so I just kind of want to give that um, uh, like inside look into it so yeah well that's great because if it's anything like your photographs you certainly will do that <laughs> thank you um, I'd like to uh, go to the uh, chat now and take some uh, questions from our audience uh, Anne and, and Isabella and Grace and, and Jenna thank you so much for that insight on the urban ecology and White House um, fellowships um, we have a lot of questions that have accumulated in the chat. Um, from Emmy Watkins, a student in my um, wildlife and environmental wildlife producing class, she wants to know, and I think Sarah and Chuck, this is um, geared towards you both, is how were you able to find the community, the family in Alaska, knowing that they would have such a deep connection with their environment? You know, how do you find strong characters? Uh, Sarah, do you wanna take that? Sure. 
I think, um, well, with this one, we had a massive head start because, you know, because we were working with Mary Bath, who does live in Huna. And so we were, you know, this this wasn't a case, you know, David and I were coming in, but this wasn't a case where the whole operation was sort of parachuting in and out. Um, Mary Beth and lots of Park Service staff are, are very, very close to these communities. And so that um, sense of, of respect and sense of, you know, knowing what people know and what they're willing to share and all of that um, kind of trust was really, you know, a part of this process from the beginning, since we were, you know, we were more making the films with the community than necessarily just about um, the community. So it's very different than the than um, process often is. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Here's a question that says, for the entire cohort, how do you show the environment as realistically as possible? in the process of filming? How do you establish relationships between people and animals, people and nature? How do, how do you make that realistic? And I'm wondering, maybe Tim and Robert can take this one because you were really out um, in different uh, places where showing the environment realistically was tough. Um, Tim, I'm gonna let you take point on this. I'm trying to think up an answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I'm not, I don't know if I totally understand the question, but how do you show it realistically? I think if you're in a national park, um, you are right there. Um, you know, Robert is sinking into the muck and the wind is blowing and you can't not show the environment authentically because you're so deeply immersed in it. Um, and for the Indiana Dunes film that we made, we, the entire thing was a hike along a trail traversing the dunes and the changing ecosystems uh, and habitats you experience as you go across those dunes. Uh, and it was really our movement across that dune that was capturing um, the changing environment across space, which really related to changing environment over time. Um, so I, I, I think the answer is that you can't not do it. Mm. That's, that's a good answer. I don't know if that's a cop-out <laughs> answer or not. <laughs> no, that, that was pretty much uh, my answer. The two locations we went to, uh, Indiana Dunes and Everglades, uh, were just so, uh, I don't know, I guess you could call them charismatic, that it's hard not to, to show that in the film. Mm -hmm. And then as far as connecting it to the, the people there, uh, it was really important just to talk to the different scientists and specialists prior to filming and then get their take on what some of the most important things to show were. And then you make sure you get footage of that. You uh, ask interview questions about that, get plenty of shots, get coverage, I think people call it. So uh, yeah. That's and I'll just add the second part of this question in the chat is how do you establish relationships between people and animals or people and nature? And in our videos, the people, the person that we're talking about is a scientist. And you know, scientists and science is fundamentally about establishing a very close, intimate relationship with the natural world based on deep observation and deep connections. And so our interviews with them, the stories that they're telling, the enthusiasm that they're showing for plants or you know, centipedes and insects um, uh, brings out that relationship in a very authentic way. And I just want to do a shout out too to Robert's macro um, yeah. cinematography because boy, if there's one thing that really connects, it's seeing things very close. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Cliff and uh, and Patrick and and uh, and Nick, who did some filming on the Lake Champlain, I think it'd be great if you could talk um, about, particularly with the bio reserves, because you're filming beyond the national actual national parks. You're 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 really getting at the relationships between people and nature. Um, do any of you want to chime in about building, establishing those relationships between people and animals, people and nature? Sure, I can. Um, How about you? Go. Okay, you, I can go. You go, Nick. Okay. So the cool thing about the biosphere project that I worked on is, first of all, I went to school at the University of Vermont, so it was an absolute pleasure to go visit the Champlain Adirondack Biosphere. But second of all, it was 
trying to represent in like an ecosystem scale area, what we tried to do was we tried to film like a variety of ecosystem types within the biosphere, right? So we tried to film different kinds of forests, hardwood and softwood, tried to film rivers, lakes. And then I guess that's we that's like the best you can do of trying to faithfully represent an ecological area, right? Or an ecological type is just trying to get coverage pretty much like what Robert did for the for the Everglades for the islands project excuse me like the macro and then so like it's a difficult thing to try to realistically cover and represent nature you kind of have to go out there and experience it we do our best but my answer would be coverage and with yeah, the also, Champlain, you were you had interviews with of such a wide range of people. Cliff, you want to talk to that? Yeah, I, yeah Nick and Leah interviewed, um, for example, the owner of an agritourism farm, where she mentioned that how she uh, she pastures horses, these draft horses, and then plants sunflowers to draw out the phosphorus from the manure so that the nutrients don't get into Lake Champlain. And um, yeah, there were interviews with the Fish and Wildlife Service and restoring trout or uh, salmon, actually, so I'm on a different one, and into the rivers, uh, uh, the tributaries of the lake and, um, and a, a, a fishing guide there. She was fishing and, and how the, um, dam restoration opened up habitat for the salmon. So those personal connections to nature are so important to bring out. You know, we have to remember that people need to identify on a personal and compelling level with nature, either by experiencing it firsthand or, you know, growing up around it. And that really helps. That's, that's um, exactly right. And I think that that's what all of these videos do is helps connect viewers with nature, with the science, with um, different aspects of the, the cultures involved. We have more questions, but we're also out of time. <laughs> and I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who attended tonight and joined us for this program. And thank you um, for all of the participants uh, from the National Park Service and students who um, participated in, in this program and, and thanks so much again to all the people who worked so hard behind the scenes to make this happen and to the Environmental Film Festival of the nation's uh, capital. And I do hope that uh, everybody will go to the DCEFF site, uh, .org site and, um, and let us know uh, what you think about the videos. Please watch the videos. Uh, the Student uh, National Park Service videos are there. Um, as well as so many other outstanding festival films. So please um, go to the dceff.org site and check out our videos and uh, the other outstanding films there. And thank you again to everybody for, for putting this program together and for this incredible partnership with the National Park Service. Enjoy the rest of your evening.